This is the Strength Matters podcast. If you're new to the show, thank you so much for tuning in. Please make sure to subscribe and review. Uh, we really appreciate all your comments and feedback. With me, as always, is my trusty sidekick. I've called you sidekick this time, James, and co-host James Breeze. How are you doing, James? I'm very well, thank you. Star Trek like you. How about that, mate? How about exactly, that? Yes, we, like have a, we have a fantastic guest uh, today. Is a legend in the strength and conditioning world. I don't use that word very often, but I think it is appropriate in uh, this guy's case. He has over 40 years experience in the field of elite athlete preparation, working with both males and females athletes from every professional league, a highly sought after speaker in the areas of strength and conditioning, athlete rehabilitation and personal training. His first book, which I am a huge fan of, Functional Training for Sports, has been described as the best book written on the topic. And his latest book, which I'm on chapter six of uh, at the moment, uh, Designing Strength Training programs and facilities takes these concepts a step further described by dan john as the coach that coaches need it is a pleasure to welcome mike boyle to the podcast mike how are you doing i am doing great guys thank you very much for having me no thank you for uh, for taking the time i know we sort of just managed to get this podcast in before you become incredibly busy uh, so thank you for taking the time out to uh, to jump on the podcast with us um what we'll jump jump in straight away and say in case our listeners have been living under a rock for a long time, uh, could you just tell them a little bit more about yourself, how you got into the industry, uh, your background, and did you always want to be a coach or did you want to be an athlete? What, what what was your sort of area? Well, I think we all wanted to be athletes and then realized <laughs> I said my, my career was ended by lack of size and lack of ability. Do you think? <laughs> that sounds you very think similar to a me. A lot of yeah. people in the sports world. <laughs> When you're not big enough or good enough, it's very difficult to continue. And the good thing was I, my desire to be a better athlete led me to training. And yeah. I start, I, I tell these stories often, but I was probably weight training in my basement in the early 1970s, honestly, with a little Joe Weider 110 pound set and a bench that my father had yeah. bought me, you know, wall chart tacked up to the wall and I went to college with the idea that I, you said, you know, do I want to be a coach? I went to be an athletic trainer because I didn't think I did want to be a coach per se, yeah. strength and conditioning coach. And even really personal training didn't exist, exist. Strength and conditioning coaching didn't exist. None of these things yeah. were even considerations at that time. And so I went there, studied athletic training, but as I was in college, the strength and conditioning field started to kind of percolate a little bit. And suddenly there were sort of the Boyd Epley's of the world. And there was somebody, wow, somebody's paying this track guy to teach the football players how to lift weights. And my thought process was, wow, that would be amazing. Imagine being able to combine all these things that I like. I like, I like weightlifting or strength training or whatever we were calling it at that point in time. I really like sports medicine. And I grew up in a coaching uh, house. My father was a high school teacher, a high school coach. So I've been in this. And then I ended up at Boston University. My dad was a Boston University alum and is in the Hall of Fame there for football, the American football. And <laughs> uh, <horrible>, right? <laughs> and his uh, one of his teammates was actually the athletic director at that time. I got hired as an assistant athletic trainer and very quickly thought, I'm going to be the strength coach at Boston University. And I basically quit my job wow. and volunteered as the strength coach i just literally walked across the street the, the street across the hall into this little weight room that had a couple of nautilus machines in it and a power rack and a bench press and yeah. kind of sat down and appointed myself the strength coach that would have been <laughs> about, probably 1983 that's wow. amazing Isn't yeah it crazy uh, how the industry has changed that like you could back then you could just walk in and you know basically volunteer yourself as a strength coach mm -hmm. i can't imagine what the uh you know, criteria are what the interview process is now if you wanted to do that. Yeah, they, with me, they they just thought I was crazy. They were like, you're quitting your full-time job <laughs> and you literally go across the hall and sit down. Because at that time, I sat down probably with a yellow legal pad of paper because mm. no one had a computer, no one had a cell phone. And yeah. somehow, I don't, I don't even really know... Mm, I guess we probably typed programs at that time, if I'm thinking about it. And so somewhere as in, along as in, as in typewriter typed programs. Typewriter typed, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> this three word process. So when people ask me, it's really funny because I, again, I've done a gazillion podcasts 
And people will always say things like, oh, what's the greatest innovation you can think of in strength and conditioning? And I'm like, absolutely, the computer. <laughs> and, and he's exactly. James is laughing because that's me, the <laughs> left. Mean. It's like, yeah. it, like computers, the computer, when I was in college, it was a computer room and the computer probably took up as much room as my house. <laughs> <laughs> and it couldn't really do anything. Like it could basically like add, subtract, multiply and divide. I mean, it was, you know, the, the computer that was in that room was way less sophisticated than my iPhone. Yeah, absolutely. I think, well, it was not a computer, but I remember um, our first computer games console is something my dad had. It was the Atari that went boop. Yeah. Yeah. Boop. Spectrum. Exactly. With the ball. Yeah. <laughs> that crossed the screen. Yeah. 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 The, yeah. the Spectrum as well. And I remember, I remember like the first ever PC, like the window, I can't remember what it was, Windows, something or other. And I was excited every day to go and learn how to type. Because it was like, I think it was Mavis Beacon teaches typing. And that was my thing. And I was like learning to type one by one. So I wasn't like doing this finger like this. I like, I, I I still, this type stuff. I've, I've hunted and packed all my books. I still can't really type. And, but, <laughs> but I'm really good at, sort of hunt and peck typing and I can get by, but I have no real typing skills. And my mother was a stenographer. So my mother was a great typist. Thank God. And so she would type all my papers when I was in college. Cause that time you'd had to, wow. you had to have typewritten. You must have had to do a, a lot of typing though, with, 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 on the typewriter for your, for all your programs. What minute? <laughs> that, well, no, they, they weren't very sophisticated then. It was <laughs> talking at stone age. So Brilliant. Brilliant. That's amazing. As I said in the um in the intro sorry, James, were you gonna no, no, carry on, carry on. Cool. Carry on. Uh in the introduction, Dan describes you as the coach that coaches need, which I think is a lovely quote. Um what in your opinion makes a good coach? I think what makes a good coach probably more than anything, one of the things we talk about, it's the interpersonal skills is what makes good coaches. I think we far overrate the science and periodization and all this other shit and far underrate the ability. I remember someone asking me one time because I was succeeding. And at that time I shouldn't have been succeeding in strength and conditioning because I didn't look like any other strength and conditioning coach. I was relatively average looking. I was 180 pounds. I wasn't on steroids. I wasn't super big. <laughs> And I said, I think I, it's the fact that I can get people to do what I want them to do is what sets me apart from everybody else. So I could look at someone and say, Hey, here's what I need you to do. And here's why I need you to do it. And I could get at that time, professional athletes, college athletes to just kind of march along with me. Hmm. And I think that was that interpersonal skill. My father, as I said, was an educator and was really good with people. Yeah, And I developed, or I don't think I developed, I guess I learned those people skills from watching him. My father was one of these guys. And uh, one of the things I always said, I, I was always hesitant to talk about my father. And I don't know why, because I guess it felt like bragging. But when my father died, he died very young, 60, died at my age, 63 or four, I forget. But his wake, literally, when he was supposed to, at that time, they had wakes, they were two to four and seven to nine, for whatever reason, they they thought that the family needed a break in between to go and eat dinner or whatever it was. My father's wake went from two to nine for two consecutive days, never stopped having a line out the door. And when they drove to bury him, it looked like a parade in the town. People wow. literally lined the streets wow. watching. And that was the kind of impact that he had on. And this was all kids. I still meet people today. Now my father would be a hundred. Wow. I still meet people who went to the high school and it's, I love it with my kids because my kids never knew him. You know, they never knew their grandfather. And mm. people would just rave about what a great guy he was and how he was the reason that they went to college or he was the reason that they didn't get in trouble or he was the reason. So I grew up in a situation where I saw somebody of great influence, yet a really uh, mm. common, I wrote an article about him called An Extraordinary Ordinary Man because he was, I mean, he had one job his whole life. He was he worked at the same high school the whole time that he was there. And never, in some ways, I had one coach told me, and I took it as a compliment, that he said I'd never amount to anything that I had. I had no drive. I didn't want to leave Boston University. I didn't want to go to the NFL. I didn't want to go here. And I thought, Dude, my father worked at the same school his whole life. And I, and I everybody really looked up to him. So I thought, I can yeah, kind of that's do okay. my thing in the same place forever. And if I'm good, I'll be good. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Do you think? Do you think you've always had a good eye for for movement? 
or has that developed over the years? I don't think so. I mean, I, I, I guess, but I think it's been developed. I've been very lucky. You know what I've had a good eye for? Looking at the person's paper next to me who's smarter than me. I'm a good <laughs> and And honestly, <laughs> that, when I very first got into the field, I started to look at sort of, all right, you know, they were kind of the meatheads. And I, I mean, I felt like, okay, it's pretty easy, you know, squat, bench, press, power clean. I get that part. But then when you started, to, I, I gravitated to the track and field guys, to the Don Chews and the Gambettas and Brett McFarlane, who's since passed away. These were the guys when I'd go to conferences, that's where I'd go sit and listen. I didn't want to go listen to another strength coach talk about, you know, how to squat again. I was like, okay, yeah. I got that pretty well dialed in. But I was attracted to the track and field people. And then I was attracted to the sports medicine people because that was my background. And so I think the ability to have that sports medicine education and to then realize that one of my first mentors was a, a guy named Mike Wojcik who ended up being a longtime NFL strength coach, but came from a track and field background. He was a thrower and I was really influenced by him. So I started to, I guess I just started to pay attention. I started to look and think I've always had a good analytical mind and be able to look at things, and think, okay, those, that doesn't add up. And then I'd be able to see somebody else. You know, you guys said Greg Cook actually introduced us. But I can remember the first time I saw Greg speak or Gray speak, and I thought, wow, this guy gets it. He's thinking at a different level than a lot of the other people that mm -hmm. I've seen before. First time I saw Stuart McGill speak, I had the same sensation. Wow, this guy gets yeah. it. And the ability to to and I always say this if this, you know, if I got to run college, the ability to recognize people smarter than you and then immediately steal their stuff. It's key to the field. <laughs> We've been stealing off a, a lot of people because there's definitely a lot of many, many, most people exactly. I would say, James, are smart. I don't know, as you say, yourself, Mike is, Mike Gray. Is <laughs> yeah, Mike is absolutely Mike. Stuart McGill, I think, I think, have we had Stuart McGill on the podcast four times over the years? Four or five times, so, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I mean, love Stuart. No, I just I remember so sitting, I was sitting in the front row at a seminar. I was one of the speakers and he was one of the speakers. And I was excited to hear him speak, and I, you know, I grabbed a seat right in the front, and I sat there. And I remember thinking, "Wow, you know." And I always thought about staff. I said, "Oh God, I'm going to go back, and everybody's going to be mad at me because I got a list of 20 exercises we're not doing anymore." <laughs> I'm listening to the talks. We were doing all kinds of different crunches, and yeah, in my mind, you know, after listening to Stu, it was like, "Okay, we're doing everything wrong." And then I'd get back and say, "Guys, we're doing everything wrong," and everyone would look, like, "What do you mean?" I'm like, well, what I mean is I just spent two hours listening to this guy that's smarter than all of us. And he said, we shouldn't do this stuff. Yeah. Therefore, we're not going to do that stuff. <laughs> and that was sort of the evolutions of our program as we went along yeah. was this consistently looking for people that were going to be better in an area than we were. And then going and watching those people. I did that years ago with Mark Verstegen and I can remember going to to then what was the International Performance Institute uh, down in Bradenton, now IMG Academies. But when Mark was there, it was ball Terry tennis. And then they had in, contained inside that what they called International Performance Institute that Mark ran prior to Athletes Performance, prior to Exos. And I just remember watching him and thinking, wow, they're doing some really cool stuff. We have to figure out a way to incorporate that into what we're doing. So I think the, the cool thing about our programming now is that it's a, at a really high level of evolution because we've been evolving it for 40 years. We've been consistently looking at what, what would be best practice, whether it was best practice in physical therapy or whether it was best practice in speed development, whatever it was, and then saying, how do we incorporate that into what we're doing? Yeah. In a way that makes sense. We, you know, the idea of, you know, we're not throwing out the baby with the bathwater. We're not throwing our program away. We're simply saying, is there a way, you know, can we improve our warm-ups? Can we improve our mm. plyo drills? Can we improve what we're doing from a medicine ball standpoint? I remember, you know, at IPI, they had a huge market at a medicine ball wall built. The medicine ball wall, and I'm not kidding, was probably, I'm going to say it was 80 feet long and 20 feet high at one end of the building. Just poured concrete wall. Wow. wow. And they were doing all these throws off the wall. And we had tried medicine ball stuff because I had listened to the track guys and everybody would talking about medicine balls, but we were outside like kind of throwing him and then chasing after them. And 
It's like this, you know, guys didn't really like it. Guys thought it was stupid. You know, the further I throw it, the further I have to go get it. You know what I mean? It was like, <laughs> this is dumb. And then I started to realize, and that's one thing that's in, you know, we talked about that in the new book and that was in the first version of the book, medicine ball walls. Yeah. The ability to throw the ball with velocity and have the ball come back to you was just so sensible. I just remember looking and thinking, I can't believe we're not doing that. we got to figure out how to do this. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah but it's, it's, on, so it was, it's, it's interesting what you say about the idea of being interpersonal and, and making keeping it simple, almost like keeping it simple stupid. Like one of the things I see time and time again is that particularly in today's field, there's a lot of people who have access to a lot of information and they go down the science and information route but they don't work on that interpersonal skills. You, you know, from all the years working with athletes, they're social beings. They want to be part of a team sport most of the time. They want to, they want to be interact. They want to be communicate. And if you can't communicate across efficiently, no matter how much you learn or dive into the research and seeing what's going on, they ain't going to get it. And they're not going to buy into what you're trying to do. And I think we, we call it bedside manner here in, in the, as a doctor, for example, here in the UK. I think you need a good bedside manner, but the ability to break things down and communicate things really simply. And that's what we're trying to do, even with like, there's some of the stuff that you do. And I, and I think you do it you know, fantastically well. Like taking this stuff from Stuart McGill, all these other guys, um, who are out there as well. Don't mean you have to make it simple. And it applied, I think, if we, obviously your main target is, is athletes. We're working mostly with aging athletes. So we have to take your work a little bit sometimes, right? Okay, what's going to work here for the aging master's athlete and how can we apply it appropriately there? So it's, it, is, it is great how you take that stuff and we can read that and go quickly, okay, that's how he's doing it with them. Okay, this may or may not work here. But what you deliver and what you speak, particularly in the new book as well, is it's practical. And I think that's a really important thing. I don't care what the science says half the time. It can work great, but if it doesn't relate to within, within the coaching room or on the coaching floor, no one's ever going to get it, right? And that's what I think you do really well is you blend the two together. That's what I'm trying to say. I think, honestly, you're right. I think that's what we do really well. I think that's what what we've done really well over a long period of time because, as you said, I think – and again, our problem, our problem in the field, there's a lot of problems, but one of them – and I always in my presentations, I have these di different, the different guys, you know, and one of the guys is the scientist guy who, I mean, he's brilliant, but he can't communicate. And then there's the bodybuilding guy, you know, who just, I mean, he's jacked. He looks unbelievable, but he can't communicate and mm -hmm. got to be able to get like for us, I'm always looking now. I want people with that look athletic and have great communication skills. Yeah. We tend, and I've said this a bunch the last couple of years, if I, if someone is applying for an internship or says, hey, I want to come and help you out, if they say I'm a bodybuilder or I'm a power lifter or I'm an, Olympic, I'm an Olympic lifter, I consider those to be drawbacks, not benefits. Yeah. And years ago, everybody in the field would have probably identified themselves as one of those groups in strength and conditioning. And now I look at it and think, gee, I need an athlete. I need ideally a team sport athlete with really good interpersonal skills. And then I can teach them the strength and conditioning stuff is not tremendously complicated. But getting a communicator, I always say, you know, someone someone who likes people versus someone who likes working out. I mean, that's the other thing. Someone will say, well, you know, I want to go into this field. I really like working out. And I'm like, yeah, that's a shitty reason to go into this field mm -hmm. just because you like working out. If you said, I want to go into this field because I really like helping people i really like seeing people improve that's where it would be significantly better mm -hmm. i agree it's, it's, it's interesting the way the way we approach it here in developing coaches in-house here at strength matters for example is i what i'm i well we've coined this term called the t-shaped coach well i'm looking for like coaches who have a breadth of knowledge right but they go specialist in certain areas so I'll give a classic example. You know, the, the breadth of the top, the top of the T, as we call it, they have basic knowledge in health and fitness. Great. Everyone has that and they can specialize in certain areas. They know some basics about nutrition and lifestyle habits, behavioral psychology. You know, that's kind of the right hand side of the T. Then the left hand side of the T, I want them to know a little bit about business. Not everything, not, not but enough to be dangerous with it, but they understand what we're doing with the business compartment. But then on the I shape of the T, we all want to specialize in different areas. So for me, for example, I'm passionate about strength training and cardiovascular development. Those are my two areas of speciality, right? Josh knows a little bit about what I do with that. You know, he knows enough as well. But his, Josh's area is then nutrition and lifestyle and fat loss, right? So when I'm developing, working for coaches, I'm looking for them who specialize in these little areas, but have this top of the T breadth of knowledge too, to all complement each other. But I'm with you. Like I look at powerlifting and body lift, bodybuilding as 
Because when we're talking about longevity and health span for most of our clients, right? Powerlifters and bodybuilders don't fit that bill most of the time, unfortunately. And people have like crapped all over me most of the time for saying that sort of stuff, but they just don't. You know, bodybuilders know a lot about fat loss doesn't mean they're healthy and the same with powerlifters and getting strong and also like my thing is like we want aging athletes who are mobile and fast still i know you i know speed declines and power declines over age but i want to make them and prolong that thing i don't see many fast powerlifters <laughs> i don't really see many you know fast bodybuilders in that case, in that sense and it's it's that kind of like knowledge that you're right you're finding right what works for you guys and it's that's a whole different crowd and we're definitely not as part of that crowd anymore well and that's I think that at least where I read it was in range with Epstein. Mm -hmm. He talked about I people and T people and yeah. you need your I people. Stuart McGill's my I person yeah. when it comes to core training and low back pain. Yeah. I need to have that guy, you know, Greg cook is my I person when it comes to evaluating movement. I, and I need for me to be a good T person. I need to identify who my I people are. Yep. I think that's a really big key to being successful. So that's it. And you're right. I mean, that's what we're looking for. But like for me, you know, if I'm thinking that T is made up, like, you know, it's almost like for me, maybe the T is a little bit slanted in terms of, I want to slant towards the interpersonal side, because I feel like yeah. any knowledge can be backfilled. Mm -hmm. But I'm very fun. I used to quote all the time. I said, I, I can make you smarter. I probably can't make you nicer. Like if you're, <laughs> you're, an asshole, you're an asshole. And I'm probably as an adult, <laughs> I'm not going to be able to change that. Yeah. But if you said, oh, Mike, I don't have a really great I have, I have one of our best coaches, Courtney, uh, has pretty much no background in any sports science at all. She played two sports in college, yeah. cross and ice hockey. And she has interpersonal skills coming out her ears. Yeah. And she's one of the best people that we have. But if you put her on the board and say, hey, I'm going to ask her a bunch of complicated questions about strength and conditioning. I don't think she'd probably do great. Yeah. Yeah. She'd be able yeah. to give you a pretty rudimentary explanation and she'd be able to say, well, this is what we do. Yeah. And here's how we do it. Yeah. And I, I, think I would say, you know, internal combustion, I can drive a car. <laughs> I do not understand the process of internal combustion. No. I could not explain to you really how the car works or like what the carburetor does yep. or any of that stuff. But I'm not at all hesitant to drive. I don't ever get in the yeah. car and wow. I really shouldn't do this because I don't understand the workings of the engine. I, and, I love that. Sorry, sorry my kick out inside. Sorry. No, no, I said, you know, so that it's like, I think that's a big part of where we need to be in the field. We have so many people who understand all about the engine. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And they're probably shitty drivers, you know, they're out. Yeah. Crack <laughs> and yeah. And think, but well, I could explain to you exactly, I know exactly what was going on in the, you know, inside. I'm like, it doesn't really matter. That, that's yeah. relevant. It's absolutely, I, I can relate on that, on that on so many levels because uh, luckily enough, like I'm fortunate enough to have been, um, so in, uh, I was a police officer in London for quite a long time and I was in what are the police equivalent of Top Gun for driving. So I was, I was a big part of that. At no point on my, how many weeks courses I did, like four to six months worth of courses at that time, did we ever learn about the inner workings of the car? We were taught how to drive it. That's exactly what we did and how to drive it fast and how to drive it safely and communicate at the same time. And I come back to my de my degree was French and German and in computer science. I didn't go in the sports background here. So what I found was like, as I was learning, man, I got given, Pavel gave me a book, a copy of Grey Cook's movement book, right? And I opened it for the first time and I was like, I don't understand a single word of this. <laughs> I, I looked at it like, I don't understand it. This is, this is too complex. And I like, just kept trying to, trying to figure this out. And I, I realized the more I found and read stuff, there's like the stuff I didn't understand, but I had to make it simple for me to understand. And I thought, well, if I can't understand this and I'm really passionate about this, how is Joe Bloggs on the street going to be able to understand it too? So that's been our mission all the time. Like, same as you with Dan, John, who I love as well, how he keeps things simple. It's like, how do we dumb it down? Not in a bad way, but like, how do we take, something that's extremely complex and simplify it into just a few words or sometimes like you say in your in your work getting people into positions where you're doing very very little coaching they're just doing it without you saying anything right and that's kind of hold my whole process and thought process trying to build is get that idea find smart people make it easy to understand and then apply it that's practical in the weight room or wherever it wherever it may be but communication i think i if out of anything from my time in the police like it was the communication skills you had to learn because if you didn't learn it properly, you get a punch in the face, like quite simply, right? And as Mike Tyson says, if you get, you know, 
you, you, everything's easy to get punched in the face, right? And it's um, it's one of those sort of things that you don't get the communication right, but that's what people connect to. And the more you can get connected with people, the more they'll buy into your philosophy and then you can get them better results and get them to where they want to get to. So we're fully behind the idea of communication being more important than degrees, aren't we, Josh? And I think a term that we use as well is that we have a policy here at Strength Matters stolen from the, from the New Zealand All Blacks, as in no dickheads. So hashtag no dickheads is our policy. We don't work with anyone who's a dickhead. We don't have any people who come into the company as a dickhead, like anything here. So fortunately, Mikey passed the no dickhead test. So there you go. <laughs> like, congratulations. I'm a, a big believer. I always said, you know, it's I love legacy. And I actually, yeah. you talk about Starstruck, I was actually in London and I met James Kerr, who was the author. Yeah. One of the few times I went to somebody said, Hey, can I take a picture with you? And, uh, <laughs> yeah. And I got him to, to take a picture with me because I love, that's one of my favorite books because I, you know, it it's, helped, it's a book all about rugby. That's not at all about rugby. Exactly. Uh, you, yep. you can just read it and put, just pick your word, soccer, hockey, whatever word you want to put in, just keep thinking that word as you read the book and everything will be the same in the book as you yeah. go through. It's brilliant, isn't it? Like it's, it's, and we've had, we've had, we've had Nick Gill on the podcast a couple of times as well. Nick Gill is a, a brilliant lad to have and speak to. And it's, it is, it comes down to those three core concepts of humility, excellence, and respect, right? From the book. And like, that's a big thing for us is that humility factor as a coach, you know, what well, I'd say I'm looking for humility. That's the first thing I'm looking for because without humility, you're never going to embrace new concepts, new ideas to develop and move forward. And, you know, and then you're not going to earn the respect of other people around you. So I, I love that that book. It's one of my top 10 books, I think, in the, in ever in terms of coaching development too. So it's uh, it's a good recommendation for those who haven't read it. James yeah. Kerr, Legacy, for sure. Yeah, and it's funny, Nick. I got on the phone with Nick for an hour one time because he just contacted me out of nowhere. He nice. said, hey, you have an hour to get on the phone. But that's the humility, right? The, yeah. the humility is about not caring you know, how old somebody is, what sport they're in. It's just looking at someone and saying, I, and I mean, really selfishly, right? I think you'd have something to offer me that, and I would love to, to take you up on that offer that you didn't make it. That was, we'll that was me that, up on that, that offer. Absolutely. At, um, International Performance Institute. I knew one of Mark's, assistants daryl Edo was a friend and a casual friend at that time but i knew him enough and i just said hey can i just come down and be a fly on the wall and sit around and watch some workouts and he was like yeah it should be fine i don't think anybody will care and i just we flew down it's beautiful at that time you know bradenton florida it's a beautiful area and i thought eh, if it's bad i'll go to the beach mm -hmm. and i ended up spending days just sitting there again with my little yellow legal pad writing notes and having little conversations with myself about things that I thought we could do better. But yep. it's that ability to continually do that that will separate you out. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think Absolutely. that's something we found when we go to conferences that a lot of top coaches don't actually do. Someone like, let's say, Perry. He Nicholson, always yeah. goes to other people's talks to try and learn, which is we always try to as well. But, you know, there are, I'm not going to name any names, but people, you know, they'll do theirs and they'll they'll be off uh you know not not listen to other people i think that's one great thing about y yourself mike that you are you're always wanting to learn as we just said humility you know um wanting to expand your knowledge not afraid to you know admit when you are wrong and change like when you mentioned before about taking everything out your program when you watch stuart mcgill i think that's you know sets you apart in this field because um you get a lot of backlash sometimes on Twitter, don't oh. you? <laughs> Mike, Mike, I'll, Mike, I'll tell you this. Let me tell you this, Mike. Sometimes I just go, I make myself a cup of tea or coffee. I'll go on Twitter, what, what, look at you on Twitter, and I'll enjoy five, even sometimes 20 minutes of seeing the crap that you get. It's it's so entertaining. So thank you for that. Like, it's it's a pure entertainment. I don't know how you must, you must, I'm hoping you see it the same way as entertainment because uh, sometimes I'm like, when I do it, which is not good, but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> not enjoying a cup of tea so it's um no but i look at that and think and that's what i don't understand with people that whatever back and forth banter that's learning mm -hmm. it's yeah. teaching and for me it's adopting the current method of teaching and learning i look at people when i be like people I, it drives me crazy when people say oh, i don't do the social media thing i look at people and i think you know because again i'm 63 i'm not young but I think you're a moron. 
right? It, it's like saying, you know, I'm still walking to work. I don't, I didn't get the car. You know, at this stage of the game, you're like, nope, I'm not doing that car thing. I'm going to walk. <laughs> you think, this is progress. I'm not going to fly. I'm going to take, you know, you could take, you guys could take the boat probably mm -hmm. still to America. I think that yeah. would probably yeah, must yeah. be right? <laughs> but most of you would prefer a plane. And I, and I look at that as when people say, you know, I don't, I don't do the Instagram thing. I don't do, I don't do Facebook. And I think it's like you're attesting to your own ignorance mm -hmm. <laughs> and bragging about it. And <laughs> I just don't get it. TikTok, I, Mike. <laughs> I, I'm not. I've resisted TikTok. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> if I could figure out TikTok. I know. I don't understand it either. James, right. you know, you know, TikTok. I don't. So, understand Mike, it. Mike, this is, this is so funny, right? So our, our sister, this is off on like, a tangent, by the way. Yeah. Slight tangent here now, but our sister, we have a sister company called Cricket Matters. So like my speciality, my gift that I wish I had when I was younger, I'm done properly was I was a, I was a, I was trying to become a professional cricketer and I didn't make it because I wasn't good enough, you know, the usual thing. So you, you go into different routes. But I'm back now playing again. Uh, it's like I'm playing international. I just played an international this week against England and like for over 40. So I'm a, ma I'm a master's athlete now, right? So I'm playing with this. So we set up this, company, this side company called Cricket Matters, like just to train cricketers because cricketers are the most poorly trained athletes, I think, on the planet. They have not, they're like, it's only become professional the last really last 15, 20 years, but there's no SNC. There's nothing like in the world of baseball, right? And I'll, I'll pick your brain on that at a separate time. So I thought, do you know what? Some of the cricketers need to learn some of this stuff because they're still doing the same old crap. They're loading cricketers who throw the ball, like bowl the ball with heavy barbell back squats. They've all got back pain. They're blowing the discs out. They've got stress fractures, you name it. Right? So I thought, no, solve this. I'm done. No one's doing this. I'm going to sort this out. Let's post a couple of videos on TikTok. The reach is phenomenal. Like it's uncrazy. I've gone from naught to like 5,000 followers in the space of new, from nobody who knew me essentially. But for whatever happens, if you post something that people like, it just goes completely viral. So in all honesty, I can't recommend the videos, just simple little videos of a how-to or demonstration that somebody that blow up someone's mind and it'll go reach. And the reach is incredible. So I, I highly it's, actually I encourage you. My daughter's in the other room and she started my Instagram for me. I may get her to, I, maybe I'll make the move to TikTok because I can't recommend enough. It seemed to me to center a lot around kids dancing in the beginning, and I'm thinking it, yeah, it did for a did, yeah, at all. So <laughs> I could not see myself dancing on camera in order to entertain people. <laughs> uh, somehow... I mean, to be fair, there's there's still a lot of dancing on there. I have to say, but there is more yeah and more, more and more personal trainers, athletes, etc. Right yeah. now on TikTok, but yeah, you but there, there is still see a lot of dancing. Mike, I, I, and I, I generally think with your, with your, obviously your reach and connections and your database, I think you grow it very quickly. And I think you'll reach a, a wider audience, particularly the young, let's put, let's put the, you know, the younger crowd who maybe not know much of it. That's what they spend most of the time. So obviously massive tangent, but I, 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 I resisted and then I can now see the power of it. And I could also see the most important thing is the return on investment for time putting onto it and bringing it back into the business in terms of financial, but also imparting knowledge and, and driving conversation about certain things. So it's, it's led to more awareness and more people trying new things out. So I, I can't recommend it enough in that aspect. I got to think about that. that run I did that with Instagram. I was not, mm -hmm. I thought, again, Instagram was, again, my daughter and her friends sharing pictures, mm -hmm. sunsets, yeah. you know, whatever they did that day, what, what they ate. And then Kevin Carr one day came and said something about Instagram. And he said, yeah, Marco and I, his old partner, we have 25,000 followers Whoa. on our Instagram. And I was like, you have what? <laughs> they were like, yeah, our movement is medicine. Instagram has 25,000 followers. I came home to my daughter that day and I said, set me up an Instagram. And she's like, for what? And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I have 131,000 now. Yeah. Wow. And again, yeah. with zero people are saying, Oh, you know, you're doing a great job with organic growth. I'm like, yeah, I guess I have no idea how it's, how it's mm -hmm. working. But, but it, it's, it, it's, but you'll tend to find, so like, you know, I'll just, just, this, this, this is massive for anyone's listening. And I saw this is a massive challenge. This is, I love, <laughs> I love these podcasts. For this question stuff. In a minute. It, we <laughs> <all> <laughs> no. <laughs> but no, but it's, but it's, it's one of those things where like those, those videos you do of you, you, you speaking with your team staff meetings or like you and your car, that's perfect. Honestly, people who know about it will fart and they'll just watch it because it's a longer form format. So there you go. That's my little tip for you today. <laughs> okay. I love it. There we go. We go. Let's, let's get to the real questions, sweet Josh. Let's yeah, actually get, I love questions. this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're, happy, we're, we're almost three quarters of the way through. If you guys haven't asked me any Yeah, we should probably know. get some questions in. Yeah. Uh, you going know back, I'm not on, I'm I, was, not on I was, before we went off on a random TikTok uh, tangent, I was 
leading on to when I was talking about being humble and learning, blah, 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 and changing your mind. It was leading into this, what I'm about to say now. Um, breathing and core work, I think that's been a big uh, sort of how you change your mind, I, I, I guess. You sort of, uh, you realize that you were wrong in the past, which is very humble of you. Um, like I interviewed, I think it was back in 2015, I interviewed Patrick McKeown on the podcast and I thought his work was fantastic and really, really fascinating. And then did absolutely nothing with it. Did, did we James? We just sort of nope. went, yeah, that's cool. And then we did nothing with it. Then we started to introduce a bit of nasal breathing, you know, to try to improve oxygen uptake, you know, carbon dioxide tolerance, et cetera, et cetera. So we were sort of scratching the surface and it was only really, I think when we did your core course online, yeah. Mike, that we were like, we sort of clicked exactly like you did and went, mm, we should probably start doing this properly. And uh, cause it makes such a difference, you know, when, how you train the core, can you talk about how your approach and sort of attitude to, to breathing has changed your and informed your core training? Well, first I'll say, um, I feel like you in some ways, cause I feel like we're still not anywhere near where we should be yet, Yeah, but we've drastically changed in terms of, and I was lucky enough, I, I was on Patrick's podcast and he did our podcast and they did a staff meeting for us. And the basic idea is that when I first started out, I thought the whole breathing thing was dumb, truthfully, because I said, everybody, right, right from the first smack, you know, you start crying and you're breathing and you don't stop. <laughs> and, then, and then, I you know, I would make jokes like that all the time. All my clients are breathing. I don't think I need to teach them. I don't have any dead clients. I, I, you know, I had a million <laughs> one yeah. that all appear even more ignorant now than they probably did at the time that I was using them. Because then I started to look at, I, Sue Falsoni, I still remember, came yeah. uh, one time and spoke at our staff meeting. And she started out her talk. And Sue, she's I love Sue. She's just a brilliant person. And she said something to the effect of, the diaphragm is my favorite muscle in the body. And I just remember I sat there and went, hmm. The diaphragm is a muscle. Like I thought of the diaphragm like as a, like it's a thing, mm -hmm. not really a muscle. You know, kind of like a lung is a lung, a liver is a liver, yeah. diaphragm is a diaphragm. And then she starts explaining how the diaphragm works and how the dome descends when you, uh, you know, when you're inhaling. And, and I'm like, wow, this really, this is a muscle. And then, that just started to lead me. Okay, now you start looking at the anatomy of breathing, and you're realizing, okay, when I exhale, the 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 dome is basically ascending, and you it's kind of very um, counterintuitive, right? Isn't it? Yeah, incongruent, I guess. You look yeah. at it, counterintuitive, however you want to look at it. Like, okay, it doesn't really make sense, but then you start realizing, okay, when I really maximally exhale, the muscles of exhalation are my deep abdominal muscles. They're the, what, you know, when I try to completely evacuate my abdominal category, what I end up doing is getting this great contraction of my deep abdominal muscles. And then I started thinking, wait a second, we've got to, because in the past, before that in core training, we were telling people things like, you know, fire your transverse, squeeze this, do this. <laughs> and again, all very well intentioned. You know, we were sort mm -hmm. of we were wandering around in the science of this room that we didn't really have. You know, we probably, I guess, it would be more like we were wandering around, you know, with a blindfold on in that room. Yeah. Well, it's like, you know, said brace or draw in or what. Yeah, exactly. So we were like, brace, draw in. And then we argued about brace versus draw in. And then when we started thinking, wait a second, how about if we just said exhale and really think, you know, and then you get into understanding exhalation, purse lipped exhale. And, you know, you go back to your day, you know, um, in Epstein's book, In Range, he talks about undiscovered connections. Mm. You start to discover the connection in respiratory therapy of pursed lip exhale. Now, in respiratory therapy, they've been talking about pursed lip exhale forever. Uh, those of us in the training world were completely ignoring them. So suddenly we're thinking, wow, what you inhale through really matters. You know, you've got a piece here that was made for inhalation. And, you know, it's got hairs in it to, to, to trap dust. It produces nitric oxide. <laughs> It's all this really cool stuff that happens. And then, you know, we've got these other muscles that help us to maximally exhale. And then we wonder, and we've got these other muscles up here, scalenes and traps and all these things that are accessory inhalation muscles that we probably don't want to use. And then you start watching somebody 
who doesn't breathe well and you kind of see them laying there like <sighs> and i remember i was watching a guy on on one of the news channels one time and i thought my god this guy's he's near death because he was talking and i could see his necktie going up and down mm -hmm. and i'm realizing this guy probably has terrible headaches and terrible neck aches and all these other kinds of maladies going on that could literally be solved if someone said i'm going to teach you how to box breathe right but so i guess i mean we could literally spend the whole <laughs> podcast on breathing yeah. <laughs> yeah. but the basic idea for us was that we realized that uh, we were going to do better with isometric holds Mm. And we were going to do better if we let those isometric holds contract, um, pair themselves up with exhalations. Yeah. So when I'm thinking, I mean, when I want a core contraction, what I tell somebody is I want a maximum exhalation. I want you to try to exhale for five minutes or five minutes, five seconds. Sorry. <laughs> and <laughs> good luck with that. Yeah, so five, five that would. <laughs> it would be really good if you could do it. But, yeah. um, for five seconds and it drastically changed what we were doing from a core training perspective because suddenly and i and i think i think there'll be more turns of the wheel because i think one of the things with patrick's work is i don't think patrick has simplified it enough yet i think because you know he mm -hmm. sent me breathing book right. and massive i mean massive mm -hmm. brilliant but way too much information and and I think that's Gray's movement. You know, you look at Gray's yeah. movement, same thing, massive book, too much information. And yeah. what we realize now is we need sort of the, the Reader's Digest version or the Cliff Notes version of these books where someone said, okay, I'm going to try to scrape out all the other stuff and just leave the good stuff in. Mm -hmm. And I think every time we get that, it's like it, Sue was able to do that a little bit. Sue Felson did a really nice job. Her book, uh, I can't think of the name of her book right now. Um, her rehab book, but oh, I, I said chapter eight was breathing and her chapter eight was worth buying the book for because it's just that chapter, because she did a really good job of that. Okay. I'm going to boil this down. No pun intended to, mm -hmm. uh, to the real essentials. Yeah. And, and that's what I tried to do. I, I rewrote that core chapter is probably the longest chapter in my new book. And I, you know, you're trying to, to again, compress the information and make it really understandable and i actually used it the first time i used this analogy but i you know one of the things because now we get into people who are there uh i call them the anti-anti-rotation people and <laughs> which i said that actually that was one of our questions actually that was, that was they're, quite they're pro rotation i think if you're anti-anti-rotation then you're pro-rotation but <laughs> when you look at those people and you realize wow now there are people who are saying you know, anti-rotation exercises are bad and, and it's, it just shows their complete lack of understanding. And they say, you know, people are supposed to move. And I'm like, we get it. Um, mm -hmm. We're not, we're not asking someone to become a statue. Mm -hmm. We're just looking at what the muscles do. And I use the analogy of um, rope on a sail. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I said, the sail is useless without the rope. Right. I mean, the other, the sail would just be flapping around in the breeze. Mm -hmm. If you didn't have that, that's that anti-rotation effect in terms of, there has to be a controller. And yes, we realize that that controller may move, may expand or may contract. But ultimately, if we look at what our core muscles jobs are, they are to be controllers. Mm -hmm. They're not primarily movers. Yeah. If I think about, you know, again, you get, you're talking about cricket, but you know, if I'm, if I'm going to throw something hard or fast, it's going to come from hip internal, external rotation. Yeah. And I'm going to have to control my trunk is going to be now a decelerator as I try to control that rotation as I move through. Because if I didn't, and I always say to people, if you watch somebody throw and they couldn't decelerate, you know, you talk like the, the fast bowler in cricket, the yeah. arm would be just continually to, would spin forever. You know, it'd be spinning. Yeah. Until, <laughs> okay. It ran out of energy and it slowed down. Now it's at your side. It doesn't, right? Yeah. You know, you're, you're, your muscles in your back, the muscles in your core, the muscles in your rotator cuff, they function as a decelerator to change the acceleration that you created. So you're creating this acceleration, you know, off of your back foot through your hips. But now as you're transferring, what the core does, I always say the core is a transfer station. Mm -hmm. It has to take that incredible rotary ability that you created with your lower body 
and then transfer it into your upper body. And it can't do that if it's, you know, if it's gumby, if it's just floppy, mm -hmm. right? It has to have a, a stiffness to it and a, and literally an anti-rotation control, right? Because you're going to produce them. The majority of the rotation is going to be produced in your hips. And then the control mechanism is going to be coming through your core. And so I just get so, that's where I, you know, Twitter, I get aggravated with people <laughs> think you're arguing and you don't, you're showing me by your argument that you don't understand the topic. And so if you don't understand the topic, stay out of the argument. Don't, mm -hmm. don't just say something stupid to me about, you know, David Weck and, you know, recoiling or he, <laughs> whatever it is. It's like, I don't want to hear that. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I got, I got you. No, 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 it's, no, it's, it's, it's fine. I, I was, I, 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 I had a, I had the privilege, I think is the word to say that uh, I, I, was, I went to David Weck's facility in San Diego a while, a while ago and he introduced me to that and I wasn't quite sure, for two hours, I wasn't quite sure what was happening. I think that's the best way to describe it. I'll, I'll leave it at that, but it was, a, it was a, it was a fun two hours. I'll put, I'll put it that way. <laughs> and the interesting thing, and I said to someone the other day, he has, there's something in, there is something to what he's saying, but it's not what he thinks it is because it's not, I mean, I was watching one of the running videos and he was talking about how he had invented a new way to run. And yeah. I was like, running is pretty standard over the last, however, thousands of years, you know, it's the, like, you're probably not reinventing that at any time in the near future as mm -hmm. best I can tell. And, and yeah. the fact that you think, okay, I, I just figured out how everybody should, you know, everybody's been doing this wrong. Mm -hmm. And, and I figured it out. It's like, uh, I, those kind of moments, I wish, I hope, someday that I would ever have a light bulb moment like that, where I realized that while wow, guys, I, you know, I, I cracked the code, I figured it out. We've been doing this wrong the whole time sort of thing. And it's like, eh, I don't know. Although actually I guess I did, but I did that in double leg squatting. So maybe I, I feel like I had that. Moment. <laughs> well, it's, it's funny you say that on like double leg squatting, because that's kind of like this, everything what you've been saying ties in nicely here a little bit. So like one of the biggest light bulb moments for me in my early career in the mid two thousands was, and this is just me personally, I wasn't reading any of this stuff. I was just like, you know, the, the internet was around, but it wasn't as, as what it is today. But me personally, I found that whenever I put a barbell on my back, everything hurt. Yet all the advice was for me to get faster, stronger and play better was to load more weight onto my back and squat more. So I, I followed the, the herd uh, and I got hurt a lot. I had back pain a lot. Funnily enough, I got slower. <laughs> I got all these different things. So I just made the constitution. You know, what? I'm, I'm not I ain't doing it. I'm taking back squats out of my thing altogether because me personally, it hurts. I'm getting injured. It's a waste of time. But everyone was like saying all this stuff. It's like, no, keep loading, keep doing it here now. And in, in today's world, like in cricket, we talk about cricket and the ability to rotate, you know, to resist rotation, anti-rotation. I'm seeing cricketers load heavy barbells onto their back, onto their shoulders, and and they're not doing any of the, you know, we can talk about training for in here for, for until the cows come home. But in, in essence, what I'm seeing is like, you know, similar similar to pitchers in baseball, they're loading heavy weight, they're compressing their spine, they're compressing everything in their shoulders, and they're internally rotating. So they have, they're trying to bowl and pit and throw the ball hard with internally rotated shoulders like this. Everything's all gunky and they're trying to throw it faster and they're breaking down all the time. Yet they're still loading them with heavy barbells on their back all the time. What was the light bulb moment for you? When did it, when did it, when did you realize, hang on a second? Because I love your quote, like, the, the, is, is it like most back pain issues in your, in your facility are caused by the barbell back squats? What was the light bulb moment for you when you found that out and started thinking about that in depth and go, no, I'm taking it out? In truth, it, it was a series of light bulb moments. So the first light bulb moment was a Gary Gray chain reaction course. And Gary taught functional anatomy. And that was a light bulb moment. Because I remember sitting there thinking, because he's talking about the idea that basically that origin insertion anatomy was silly and that it was stupid that they taught us that. And this was 90. So for me, I, you know, when I was first introduced to the thought process, someone said, you really got to go listen to Gary Gray talk. And I went to Phoenix and I sat for three days and I walked away and I was like, damn, this guy's right. Like, this is crazy, but he's right in terms of you know, the, because I remember he got up there and he said his demonstration was simply when you put your foot on the ground, every muscle does the same thing. They all decelerate flexion. Everything is working together. When you push off the ground, every muscle is creating extension. There are no 
you know, you don't have dorsiflexes and plantar flexes and knee extensors and knee flexors and hip extensors and hip flexors. He said, you just have this sort of, and you think about it, you have this beautiful concert that's occurring where everything works together. Mm. And I went back, and again, this is why I've never been afraid of change. So I went back and I get rid of my leg extension, my leg curl, my leg press right away. Boom. I went to the student recreation people. I said, you guys want another leg leg extension, leg curl, leg press? Like, yeah, mm-hmm. press awesome. I just open up enough room for another squat rack in my place and get rid of a bunch of this, you know, no quote unquote, non-functional stuff. Mm-hmm. Right? Because that's what he was really talking about function. This is how the body works. So that was kind of light bulb number one. Then you start to really, when you say, okay, I understand functional anatomy. Then you start to look at the functional anatomy of the core and you start to realize, well, wait a second. You know, when I start looking at like, you know, some of the Yanda stuff and the idea of subsystems and the fact that, Hey, wait a second. You know, my adductors are actually pelvic stabilizers and my glute medius is a pelvic stabilizer and my quadratus is a pelvic stabilizer. And then I realized, wow, from a core perspective, everything is drastically different when I've got one leg on the ground. And then you start looking at sport and saying, well, wait, and this is just being simply analytical. How often am I doing things where I'm pushing off the ground simultaneously off of both legs? And you're thinking, oh, really not, not very often. Much more time spent on one leg when I watch every sport and ambulation and all these things. So, and then the back pain thing. So it was a series. It was like dominoes, dominoes, dominoes. And then I've got all these American football guys and everybody that I have has back pain. It all relates directly to back squat, every single one. And then I start, you know, we play with front squats and belt squats. And then eventually I get to this point of thinking, uh, well, you know, I love the one leg stuff, but I can't figure out how to load it heavy enough. Then we get to the sort of rear foot elevated split squat. And I always say, of all people, it's Joe DeFranco. Like the the guy who pushes me over the edge in unilateral training is a guy who's never been a proponent of unilateral training. Like (laughs) Joe in in his day was like a meathead's meathead, right? Mm -hmm. And, And he's showing some guy split squatting 240 pounds. And now I'm thinking, wait a second. And then... Uh, have you ever have you ever run across Robbie Bork, who's an Irishman? It's really super. Yes, smart. I have. Yep, yeah, I have. Yeah, so Robbie, I love Robbie. Robbie interned for us twice actually, and is a genius level guy. But you know, he starts talking to me about bilateral deficit. And he's like, you really need to go back and look at this bilateral deficit research. So again, it's like just domino, 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 mm-hmm. and so we just we're literally rolling with it in terms of hey, we're going to try this heavier split stand stuff, and then we start seeing. Wait a second, our guys are handling ungodly amounts of weight relative to what they supposedly could handle in a bilateral back squat. And so you, you go from being kind of a science denier to looking at it and saying, wow, I understand what they meant about bilateral deficit. And now I'm seeing less injuries. And now I'm seeing, you know, more function, more relation to injury prevention. It's just, you know, it's like, you've got to, you know, you're, you're going with like your check marks on one box checks, you know, checks and balances, however you want to look at it. You're thinking I got like a hundred checks over here on my, you know, <laughs> on my bilateral side, on my unilateral side. And the only one I can find over here on the bilateral side is that's the way we always did it kind of thing. <laughs> There's it, nothing else. Yeah. So it was not ever that, you know, aha, I figured it out thing mm-hmm. as much as it was this gradual process of, I'm being overwhelmed with the, um, I guess, you know, in some ways, you know, I'm, I'm getting overcome with the confirmation bias because it just keeps coming at me over and over again. Then I started talking, people would always ask me about research and I'd say, you really need to research the bilateral unilateral thing. So guys start doing studies and all the studies start saying the same thing where at least every study says at least equal. Mm-hmm. usually better no matter what they look mm-hmm. at and they compare somebody doing a unilateral program to a bilateral program the worst case scenario is that the results are equal and in general the results would have were better in almost every study that's been done so then you're thinking and then you're like okay i cannot get people hurt and i can get minimally the same performance benefits. But if I really believe in this idea of function and functional anatomy, I'm getting far more for that than I was. So it's just, I mean, just having this overwhelming stack of evidence. 
Mm. And in so, terms of your your single leg training, rear foot elevated split squats, obviously they were your go to, but you've started to move away a little bit away from those now. We have because what we realized is that after a while, people just it was a a very task orientation. Mm. I need to, to do more weight in this exercise. So it you know, I said it was like scissors. You know, people started getting better at pulling with their back leg. They they were figuring out ways to move more weight that weren't really what the original intention of the exercise was. The original intention of the exercise was for someone to be really, I used to say like an outrigger on a canoe, your weights really concentrated on your front foot and your back leg is strictly there for balance. Yeah. yeah. And instead it became this two legged thing where people would say their back hurt or their backside hip flexor was sore. And I thought, and that's not really where we wanted to go. So we started going to more skater squats, more uh, true one leg squats and then I run across Alex Natera's stuff, mm. which, yeah. and this is the beauty. Like for me, it never yeah. stops. It's like the hits just keep on coming because this guy, Daz Drake, Daz Drake is a, a personal trainer in England. I don't know him at all, except to have communicated with him over the internet, but he writes an article basically where he's linking my book and Alex's research. And somehow I end up with that article. I don't remember how maybe he sent it to me. I'm not sure, but I start looking at Alex's stuff and I'm thinking, wait a second, way, way more validation for mm -hmm. what we're doing from a unilateral perspective. And I start to communicate with Alex and ask him questions. And it, so we've just, it's, uh, it's the continual sort of motion of this going down the rabbit hole. And right now we're, we're so far down that we're probably never coming up. But what, why, what, what, here's a question to you. Why is the barbell back squat so controversial? Like, I, I don't understand it. Like, it, it, I, I look, I'm, maybe I'm sold. Maybe I'm a, the believer. People like, people love the barbells, James. People love Yeah, true. But, it, but, it's, but I'm seeing it's it now. Sacred, like, it's, it's the sacred power. Literally, it is yeah. the sacred power of strength and conditioning. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. if you think, again, if you go back to that power lift or Olympic lift, if you go back to mo most of the people who were the influencers prior to maybe people like me, Mm -hmm. were bilateral people, bodybuilders, powerlifters, Olympic lifters, doing things bilaterally made perfect sense for them. If you bilateral squatted, you could develop symmetrical legs. If you bilateral squatted, you could be a good powerlifter. If you bilateral squatted, you could improve your clean. They weren't performance people, yeah. but they were the influencers. And mm -hmm. I think when you start to take the influence away from the influencer, they tend to really fight back. It's like that three stages yeah. of an idea, right? You, you know, you go through that three stages of the idea and, you know, it's, you know, first, you know, people are, um, you know, first they laugh at you, then they violently oppose you. Right. And, and then <laughs> in the third stage, they, they act like it was their idea all along. And that's <laughs> a lot of what we went through. Initially people just yeah. said, Mike Boyle's a loser. Like people would put, <laughs> like YouTube videos, Mike Boyle's a pussy, Mike Boyle's soft. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Boyle's ruining. I mean, I, literally, people. I've had people yeah. say to me, "You're ruining strength and conditioning." I've had people say to my face, "You are ruining strength and conditioning. You and what you're doing wow. is ruining our fields." Wow. And those See, people that, saying, you know, ah, I combine unilateral and bilateral now, yeah. right? You know, and that's kind of in that stage two thing, right? Where yeah. And and then you see some people. Oh, I've done. You know, we've been doing unilateral stuff forever. You know, Mike yeah, Boyle, yeah. Mike, oh, Mike Boyle invented step ups. And you're like, oh. the same person who was recording YouTube videos saying what a loser I was ten years ago. Yeah. And now you're saying how yeah, I've been doing that all along. You know, Mike Boyle's not so smart. He didn't think up this stuff by himself. Mm -hmm. And you can watch the the evolution of these people. But there are yeah. some when you look at it, it's very similar to how I think people would look at things like politics or religion. There are people who their beliefs are strong mm -hmm. and they're very steeped in something not scientific. Yeah. And I think that's say, the James, back squat. Yeah. We always say, James, don't, you know, don't talk about, uh, if you're at the dinner table, nutrition, yeah. politics, religion, kettlebells. and kettlebells. <laughs> guns. Yeah. Yeah. The royal family. It is li royal literally, family, it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Controversial oh, I subject. I, thought, yeah, I still can't believe you guys have a royal family. I'm like, <laughs> Continue uh, to employ these people. What is going? You know, uh, yeah. <laughs> someone come to this. They, apparently, they it. make some money for us or something, don't they, James? But I was yeah. going to say, James, looking quickly, just looking back at like cricket, mate. Your 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 sport. That's they're still kind yeah. of in the dark ages. That's still they these are, really heavy barbell back squats. It, it's honestly, you know, it's Mike. Like, that 
there's a there's a massive problem in professional cricket right now where fast bowlers, for those who know, it's like like similar to pitchers who are getting stress fractures on their back, like literally, literally stress fractures time after time again. They're breaking down time and time again because and they're so far behind in strength and conditioning. Exactly, they're doing what we did thirty years thirty ago. years ago. That's yeah. exactly we right. Seeing, we were seeing that thirty years ago, where guys, you know, you're thinking. Okay, wait a second. You know, this guy's getting injured because of the training. Yeah. And then we come around. I mean, I've, you know, I've been preaching for 20 years at least, right? The, you know, the number one goal of training is to, you know, how huh? or decrease the incidence of injury. Yeah. yeah. Number two goal of training is not to get hurt in training. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. Absolutely. It is. Absolutely. But just, We're seeing like professionals, aren't we, James? Like, Dude, their, their squat technique is terrible as well. Oh. It's not like it's oh, yeah, well, good. That's, that's, I, I, that's my. <laughs> I, I posted that the other day because it's people are posting videos, and I'm thinking it's sad because they don't even realize that what they're posting is bad. Exactly, yeah. I know that. That's that's that is the problem I'm seeing, and I, I'm I'm trying my hardest. That's, now that's where it's almost it. hopeless because if someone's posting a video of something that's bad for you, and you're doing it badly, and the person who thinks that they're looking at it thinks that it's good like that's yeah that's probably incorrectable yeah, yeah. exactly and then so mike, mike just just kind of moving this segues on a little bit here now like i i love like one of the best things i think you've done to influence me in the last few years is introduce me to the work of tony holler and feed the cats um i really like you know you talk about you, when you said like i remember i think you did a talk for perform better sometime i can't remember when it was I remember you saying that record, rank, and publish, right? That was like like, like the aha bold moment for you in terms of speed training. It was like, wow, that, that's so simple, but it's it's so true. But I want to tie this into speed training and how, like, talk about how your development of guys getting faster in the weight room or, like, faster for their sports in general and tying it into the idea of heavy barbell back squatting, which I'm seeing a lot of people do as well. Like, talk to me about how your process now is in terms of speed development for the athletes, and like how it how you combine like say the flies the timings and also maybe with the weights how how is your focus what is your well, focus around that now it's interesting and tony's another example you know much like stuart mcgill or gray or whatever of finding somebody who's doing something better than you and you start thinking wow this guy's writing a lot of really interesting stuff about speed development he's a high school guy but he seems to be having really good results with his high school kids with this and so again it's just another rabbit hole that I chase down. And again, I, I meet Tony. I bring Tony out to speak to our coaches at our facility. Uh, I, I introduce Tony to everybody that I could think of. I'm like, everybody needs to know who mm -hmm. Tony Holler is and hear him talk. And it is that the simplest point, one, is that that I thought of is we used to use speed work as a test. So we would go in the weight room and do, you know, lots of cleans and lots of squats and lots of other things. And we kind of run some sprints but it wasn't very uh there was not a lot of structure to it and the reality was they weren't even really sprints because one of the things that we realized if you're not timing them the athletes are not eliciting their maximum because you've eliminated the competitive aspect of it and when we suddenly mm. bought a timer and put the timer out there everything changed incredibly because suddenly now people knew exactly where they were in the pecking order. There was no more mm -hmm. perception of, oh, I'm faster than this guy. It's like, no, you're not. He ran faster than you. Like his time was this. Your time Absolute. Was Absolute. Yeah. Yeah. Therefore, he is faster than you. And you can talk to me about, oh, I'm faster than him in the game or I have better games, whatever. He's faster than you. He may not look faster than you, but that doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is we're timing your movement over 10 yards. He traverses 10 yards faster than you traverse 10 yards that produced an effect in our kids particularly that i wasn't expecting and kids started to get fast like my son is the perfect example my son got fast fast he was not <laughs> when we first started timing he looked at me and, and you know i remember there were kids in his group that ran a one four and he ran like a one eight he was like dad i'm slow and i was like yeah you're right you are but two weeks later he's running one fives and what was just happening was that he suddenly realized, well, you know, if I try harder and push the ground harder, I go that way faster. <laughs> it was just this beautiful cause and effect relationship. Yeah. And then you start talking, you know, Tony's talking about 
one of the things that he had said was, I don't care if my sprinters lift. I only care that my sprinters sprint. And that led me down another thought process because, again, this is, you know, uh, there's so many tangents here. But so I was a Ben Johnson versus Carl Lewis guy because Mm -hmm. Ben Johnson fit my narrative, right? Ben Johnson with my confirmation bias in terms of he lifted weights. He could squat 600 pounds. He could bench 365. Lewis, on the other hand, was a little bit of a, you know, a, a disdainful lifter. Like he did it because they made him do it, but didn't really like it. And yet when you looked at their times, you know, if you study that race, which is probably the most studied race of all time, identical. I mean, like, you know, the winner was hundreds of a second ahead. And, you know, if you look at every split, almost identical, almost identical. And you think, wow, two almost directly opposite training approaches in the weight room. Two nearly identical results on the track. And then you take, again, you, you put your logical brain on and you think, wow, what do these guys have in common? What's the commonality? And, you know, it's idiotic, right? It's the, the duh moment, sprints, mm. right? They both ran sprints and they both did jumps. And Lewis saying, I was a jumper who ran the 100. I was a long jumper that ran the 100. And yet he was the second best 100 meter guy in history at that time. And you start thinking, wait a second. This sprinting and jumping probably has way more bearing. You know, we're probably seeing, you know, we're just, again, confirmation bias. We're just looking at Lewis and thinking, you know, he doesn't fit my narrative. And I'm looking at Johnson and he fits mm-hmm. my narrative. So then I always, I, I have a video of, of Bolt strength training in uh, Jamaica. And I always tell people, just go YouTube Usain Bolt strength training. It looks like the YMCA in 1970. It's, like, <laughs> it's, like me and my friends it's so bad, right? <laughs> and you look at this guy and think, okay, he's on this absolutely abysmal strength program where they, I mean, just if you, you'll laugh at harder than you do right now when you watch the clips, you will be hysterical. Yeah, okay. And I look at that and think, oh, wow. You know, if I put him on my strength training program, I could probably make him the fastest man in the world, (laughs) except he's already the fastest man in the world. (laughs) Right. And you come back to, well, what's the commonality? It's sprints. So we start to realize sprinting is a training tool that needs to be utilized all the time. So our guys, we sprint, you know, yesterday I had my son and his friends in, we sprint, you know, we do fly 10. So we do, we go from five yard fly, 10 yard fly, 15 yard fly, 20 yard fly. Other days we do resisted flies, you know, with, you know, sled sprints, mm-hmm. with different versions of flies. We're always timing and we're always sprinting. Two days a week, we do three to four short sprints religiously. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that, I mean, that's been, when I say quantum leap for us, quantum leap, massive change in training to the point, again, in the, the new book, we talk about, Facility design, number one thing I said, sprint area. Yeah. Yeah. That's all right. Leave a big ass space empty, the longest straightaway that you possibly have, and use it to sprint in. But whatever that is, like ours indoors now, we have uh, 40 yards, which means we can do a 15 yard fly 10, 15 yard fly in, 10 yard sprint, 10 yard. That's 25. We got another 15 to slow down. You know, so we've only got that's that's what we can do indoors and we do it a lot and again not super simple we don't do we do very little speed teaching but guys get better at sprinting through sprinting it goes back to like the car idea right where you're saying you didn't really understand the car there's a great book called most likely to succeed and in most likely to succeed uh the author talks about uh bike riding and he he does a whole chapter on this he calls it the bike analogy and he said if if we taught bike riding in school Kids would sit forever in the classroom and they'd learn about derailers and they'd learn about different types of handlebars and they'd learn about different seats and they, they'd do a million and one things. By, by the time you get down with the class, the kid would know everything about a bike and no one would have ridden a bike. <laughs> right. And then when someone wanted to actually teach their kid to ride a bike, they would have taken their kid outside, put him on a bike and pushed him away. Right. And let him start, you know, turning the pedals and wobbling and figuring out. And within 30 seconds or a minute, the kid could ride a bike. But if you pulled the kid off the bike and said, could you explain the derailers again to me? <laughs> was, was that a banana seat on there? Was that, uh, you know, a piece of seat? You know what? The kid would be like, I don't know. I just know that I turned the pedals and I held on. You know, I had this kind of a steering wheel thing up front here. And, 
you know, I was able to negotiate all that. And so we've gone very much to the, you know, get on the bike, the self-organization route. Like we're going to get better at sprinting by sprinting. And nice, it's nice. paid massive dividends. I would strongly recommend. I've got a whole series of articles. It's actually all in that book too. There's a big section on speed, mm. which is that, I, you know, goes into kind of Tony's ideas and how we've implemented them. A lot of what I've already said, but in, in more detail, and it gives us a better idea of kind of, what's fast what kind of times you should be looking for things like that and that's and, that, and that's I'll go back to the beauty the beauty of this book now i think for any like the most of the people we work with are experienced coaches that's 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 the one side of this we got a lot of experienced coaches coming to us and working with everyday people over 30 that's that's kind of the name they're not necessarily working with athletes they're working with aging athletes okay so that's the main thing here but i think what the book does really well is it's it simplifies a lot of concepts into the stuff that we need to know practically and get it working. So like, for example, like it's all on the speed work. What I love is the fact that like, okay, well in my head before, again, I, I saw one of your videos God, was last year, two years ago, whatever, whatever it was, it was something you, you said, it was, I know it was, I know it was you, it was it the loading parameters for sleds? Like I always thought just load more weight on the sled to make them run faster. Like just load res resistance. Nope. It was like 150%, to, you know, maximum time thing, time-based effort. I was like, wow, that is so different and ahead of the curve. Like I was like, that's, that's amazing. That's like, that is, that is the light bulb moment for me then. It's like, cause I was just going heavier is better. Right. That's same as, right. same as sleds, same as sleds. Like just like load it up there, just push as much as you want to, but no, it's not, is it? And that's, and that's, and there's the research that backs that concept up. And then now you, what you're doing that is with your, with your client, with your athletes as well. Right. Exactly. And that's what we're doing all the time. I mean, that's, that was, that started out with a guy named Cam Joss, who's now down at Auburn, introducing me to um, J.B. Marin's work, who's a, a French guy. And, uh, you know, he's done a lot of research on resistance speed development. And that leads you to this other guys, um, Pierre Zamas and Matt Cross. There's a whole bunch of guys that have really studied this whole resistance sprinting thing. And they, again, steal smart guy stuff, right? Yeah. They've, <laughs> they've figured out the idea that – the maximum power up, but the maximum benefit to that sled is when you hit that 150% speed decrement. Mm -hmm. And if you go beyond that, you may be losing some of the benefit. Now, again, my friend Cam has also said he's not so sure and he's playing with things a little bit heavier, but it's also that ability to experiment Change. and to yeah. think, you, know, you go back to the old idea of you can break the rules once you know the rules. Yeah. Yeah. So I yeah. wrote an article called There's a Reason There's a Box. Actually, it's in I think I could put that in the book too. Because mm -hmm. I put a lot of my the a lot of the new stuff that I had written in the last four or five years, I put yeah. in the new book. But I always say the idea there's a reason there's a box. You know, you don't want to be an out-of-the-box thinker if you're not the master of the box. <laughs> right? If you're the master of the box, then you're free to be an out-of-the-box thinker. But if you don't if you don't know the box, you got to spend more time. You know, it's the John Wooden quote, right? Um mm -hmm. basically, you know, you don't want to learn the tricks of the trade before you learn the trade and you need to know the trade. Right. Know. And then learn the tricks of the trade. Yeah. You want to yeah. think outside the box once you really know the box. Mm -hmm. And we have too many people in our field who don't know the trade, don't know the box, mm -hmm. but they do know Instagram and TikTok. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's the sad reality. It's, it, it is funny. Like this, this, it is like, it, it's almost comical. Like I, I feel like I'm just blowing smoke up your ass here now, but I'm, I'm generally not trying to do this. It, it is literally the case of like, Hmm. me and Josh come up with an idea. We're thinking about stuff to change things. We go, hey, this stuff doesn't really work with some of our clients. We're going to think something better. Then suddenly we find some work of yours that we haven't actually read before. And it comes across, hey, well, Mike's been doing this sort of stuff already and he's figured some of this stuff out. And it's, 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 just, it's just fascinating how this kind of happens. And, and one, the light bulb moment we had, God, we've been doing this now a few years. Uh, and we've always like, See, we're European, right? This, this is, this is what we see from, from we, when we record all the numbers and stats from around the world. When we work with Americans, they're stronger and more powerful than Europeans, hands down. Like that's what we tend to see around, around the thing. However, we have a greater aerobic capacity most of the time and we're more endurance based. Doesn't mean we're faster. It means, just means we have more of a capacity in aerobic endurance because we're built for our, our systems. We have bike part lanes. We have like, we walk everywhere. Like it's, <laughs> you know, it, those little things here. So what we were, what we hated on was the idea of why are we always doing recovery when it comes to conditioning on time? When you see, you see like multiple athletes lining up. And like they're all they're all different abilities, particularly when you're working with large groups, right? And we're like, well, what this this is this doesn't really work. Like, how can we make this better? So we went to a heart rate recovery method. And uh, this is what this is what we found. We found that like 
Well, we used uh, based on Maffetone's effort. You know, one eighty minus minus your age was the was the math method for you know zone two essentially or like aerobic threshold work. Well, we found that one sixty minus your age was the ideal kind of range in finding people's like recovery methods. And like, so we so we started playing around with it. Anyway, we we watched your conditioning thing like a year and a half ago or two years ago. We're like, yeah, we found that like about one twenty is the right thing, <laughs> and it was like. Boom! Hang on a second. That's 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 an even simpler version than what you're doing with this. Like we, but when we personalize things, it's definitely 160 minus your age. If me and 40, like 120 is my thing naturally, but we find the higher levels up is here's what people work with. It's like why why don't we just just get on the phone with Mike and speak to Mike? We're having troubles now, Josh. We just call Mike up and go, what, what, what's he figured out? Like, what's he figured out and done differently? But, but no one talks about that. It's funny that we came to the same conclusions. We didn't know right. we were doing that. Yeah, but that's that's like the MAS stuff. You know, I look at you read. Yeah. I read a lot of the MAS stuff, and you realize most of the interval training protocols that you get recommended end up falling right in yeah. line with the MAS recommendations. And I found that same thing. I was looking, thinking, wait a second, you know, you know, we're running whatever, you know, we're running 110 yard sprint, and we're saying, yeah, we want somebody. It's going to take about 16 seconds. We want about 45 seconds rest, and then you start realizing. You start looking at, well, you know, 16 seconds to cover 100 yards. What is that? You know, how many yards per second am I going? Mm -hmm. It's right around what the MAS numbers are. You know, they tend to be predicted around, you know, around 5, 5.5. And you start looking and thinking, oh, you know, that's almost exactly what we're looking at here. And you realize people already had this stuff figured out empirically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did. I mean, we started, we were running with heart rate monitors, honestly, in the 1990s. And we started to realize, and again, this was where it was kind of dumb because we were using 120 because that was the theoretical 60%. I had read this Conconi Mm -hmm. called training lactate pulse rate or heart rate or something like that. And he was saying 60%. And we had mostly 20 year old guys, you know, because we were in college. So we were using 200 as kind of the base max heart rate. And then we saw 60% was 120. It was really logical. And then we always just, Mm -hmm. then we started to realize, well, gee, there's some people who do better at 130 and there's some people that do better at 110, but we still started to realize, you know, you've got that, that center point is 120. But if somebody really, if it takes them, like we'd have some people, they'd get down to 130 in a minute and it would take them to two minutes to get to 120. Yeah. And I said, was okay, you're going to start again at 130 because you, that, you know, we're doubling your recovery time for 10 beats of recovery, which doesn't seem to make any sense. And then we'd look at them and think, and they're not struggling. Mm-hmm. Struggled. Like if they'd done the next interval at one thirty, and then they really struggled, I would think, okay, we made the wrong determination. Yeah. We started to look at how, how it all worked. And then you started like, for me, it's completely formulaic. I can tell you when I do my interval work, my heart rate, recovery is going to go up by 15 seconds every interval if i do the same intervals the same like so Mm -hmm. the other day i did mild repeats on the bike two minutes and 30 seconds first recovery was a minute i knew i could write down that my next one would be 115 and right about 115 i'm at 120 again and i can write down okay the one after that's Mm going to be 130 because i'm going to add about 15 seconds of recovery per interval so i could literally write somebody's interval program without a heart rate monitor now and say Okay, first one is going to be, you know, maybe one to 0.5. You know, the second one is going to be one to 0.75. The third one is going to be one to one, you know, something like that. Mm-hmm. And pretty accurate. And then you think about that in your common sense mind. And you say, well, that makes perfect sense because obviously you'll recover better after the first interval than you would after the second. So if you're thinking, I'm just simply adding a little bit of rest after every following interval, when you sort of retroactively examine it mm-hmm. it's super logical but you think oh yeah that makes perfect sense that's exactly how we should have done it yeah but just doing it empirically from you know having guys run and looking at heart rates and recording heart rates and you know we had the same thing in terms of outliers we'd have guys some guys could get to two, 210 215 other guys could barely break 180 i still remember i had this kid richie brennan and i used to i mean i berated him i called him name <laughs> I was just not nice to him at all because his heart rate never got up. And I would just be like, you are so soft. You do not push yourself. And then one time we made everybody do a punishment ride. So they had to ride 10 miles and, you know, it was 10 miles for time on the, uh, at that time on a Schwinn air dine. And I looked and most everybody finished at right around 200 because again, college kids, 
Mm-hmm. Rich finished the he finished the exact same time as everybody, but he never broke 180 beats a minute. And I was like, shit, his heart rate, his max heart rate is 180. Like he's been going as hard as everybody. <laughs> he just yeah. has a 20 beat per minute lower heart rate. And I've, I've been and I used to, I've apologized every time I see him. I you know he's in his 40s now. Every time I see him, I still apologize to him. I'm like, you know, I'm really sorry. I called you so many bad names. <laughs> Because you couldn't get your heart rate up. And then I just realized that was just because you had a lower heart rate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but it's interesting. Go stick, stick on, on the mass stuff, like with the assault bike and everything that you're doing. Like, you know, that's the first thing I read because I'm a big fan of doing that aerobic speed work. Uh, you, you talk about using RPM. We've we've always used calories, which is interesting. Like Because a lot of our guys are remote. They work around the world. We try and keep it as simple as possible. What's the something that can, they can understand? Calories. So we just use calories. So we, we always say they got to whatever, you know, in their six minute test, they got, you know, 10 calories per minute. So we do 20% more. So again, try and do 12 calories in a minute, whatever, you know, whatever it is or like, or here. So we always use calories to bring it up. But obviously you talk a lot about the 10, 20, uh, 20, 10 kind of, kind of method in uh, using 110% and 120% based on, on the two different things here. We, we haven't done, we haven't gotten that route on that style. What we, what we tend to try and do is we, we work on extending it out, not, not beyond what the athlete's trying to do. For example, if, in cricket, for example, you're running a three. That takes you about 12 to 13 seconds. So you not you don't want to do much more than that, but we may extend it out to the 15, 16 seconds work. Nothing more than that because it's just, it's just pointless. In our, in our... But we always start small and try to extend that. Do you ever try and do things like that where you're extending it out or do you just keep it simple with a 10, 20, 20, 10 type thing? Um, no, we, we, do all, we, we change it around quite a bit, actually. Yeah. 10, 20, 20, 10, we do. You know why? Because it's on the bike. Yeah, yeah it's simple. The they can press the button. Yeah. It's built in there. Yeah. And then what we look at with that is what's the maximum distance you get during that ride. So, you know, guys would be like, what do I got to do? I'm like, well, you know, 2010, you got to be able to get 1.2 miles, 1020, you got to be able to get one mile. That'll tell you if you're working hard enough. And then we'd give them recommendations, but we were doing it on RPMs. And I, initially we used to use just level, because if you remember the old day airdynes just had level, level six, and it would mm-hmm. be like 6.1, 6.2, 6. Point. But when we got the new assault bikes, they didn't have that. And then people were talking more in terms of RPM. So we switched over to RPMs and we also switched, like we do um, distance versus time a lot of the times. So, you know, I could say to you ride 230 hard or I could say ride a mile. Hmm. If you ride a mile, you get rewarded by being able to stop sooner if you're under 230 and you get punished you know, so if somebody good is going to ride the mile in 220. Somebody bad is going to ride it in 240. The guy who's not riding as hard has to ride longer. And I always liked that. Whereas when we when we used to do it by time, I'd have to I'd watch everybody. Because, again, my slackers, if I said 15-second sprint, that guy would kind of start coasting around 13 seconds. Mm-hmm. But if I said 0.1 and you can't stop till it turns over 0.1, it's kind of like the record rank publish idea. You're incentivized to ride it in 14 because you're going to get to stop a second sooner. Mm-hmm. Whereas if we just said 15, then mm-hmm. you'd just go maybe 13 because you were a slacker. So <laughs> I, I think there's, again, a lot of, there's a lot of psychology and conditioning that we miss out on too, because again, yeah. what do we do? We listen to endurance athletes who have no idea, totally unrelatable in terms of, the average speed and power sport person mm-hmm. and we end up with all these really lousy prescriptions so it's it's interesting i gotta I, I I tell you we probably one or two more questions because uh, i probably have to oh god i'm so sorry say how long we got you for, mike, we're on an hour and we're at an hour and a half and i'm like i actually have some stuff i gotta get i'm back. so sorry mike we, we, we always said <laughs> he's, he's got a life i feel bad because i was like i could do this probably three hours i used to look at <laughs> i'd listen to the human podcast and i'm like how did they ever talk for three hours? And then I'm like, <laughs> okay, we're moving into, you know, the end of the second yeah. hour. We well, I think what we'll, we'll have to do, Mike, forever. is when, obviously, when you are free later in the year, or next yeah. year, whatever that is, we'll get you back on because we'll we'll like, yeah, I'll we've got a million that. questions. Yeah. Also as well, like Michael, on the separate thing, on our Cricket Matters podcast, I'd love to get you on to talk about your experience with baseball, but baseball players, and particularly pitchers, because like that's kind of our fastest growing audience at the moment. And there's something that's, yeah. You've got to get across to people. Yeah, yeah, that'd be but, a great talk. I love, I love talking at because I think you know, obviously, if you look at like million dollar arm, there's you know, there's a yeah, pretty good correlation between the fast bowler and the pitcher. 
a huge like, from a training perspective huge and it's and to be honest, Mike, it's massive at the moment like just in that sport alone like they just it's some of the biggest viewing numbers in the world what was right the now deal they signed for the women's cricket for the for the, for the, for the women for the for the women's game it was 96 million pounds so that's 130 million dollars um yeah. viewership deal they just did which one of the biggest female numbers in history and it's at the that, amateur level it's typical ugly american in terms of <laughs> we have no conception of that at all yeah I think I believe it is the most watched sport in the world. It is. It yeah. is in India, and, and and that's that. That's that. Mike is what I'm seeing. Like all my experience has been learning this this craft, the fitness, training, strength, movement, everything from the states. And I'm realizing how that, that it, it's so archaic over here. And I'm saying, and with the greatest respect to a lot of people, but they haven't traveled around to see things. And like you said, you know, I followed Eric Cressy's work for years. I followed your work. I followed all these all these guys who are working things. And what you guys been doing thirty years ago, as you said, that's what they're doing right now. And it's it's frightening. Anyway, we'll, we'll say it for another game. But I want, I'm actually want to talk. Is, all we want to do is hire guys like you to be our bosses over here. So that's okay. I always say, you know, the, <laughs> the way you get to be a boss in America is to have an English accent. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> English or you're Australian, someone will make you direct your performance, and you get to tell everybody what to do. Exactly. <laughs> that's. I'll, I'll remember that in future. And I'll, I'll send my CV out to people. But you I, should, I, 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 you'd, you'd, but be, I, you'd be shocked. There'd be professional sports teams pulling you in in a heartbeat, saying, "Hey." Brilliant. It's, everybody loves what they don't have. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's interesting, actually, because on the cricket side of things, there's a big push in cricket in the United States now because they've now realized the numbers and the, and the money they're making in India, and they're trying to bring it over to the U.S. And again, what I'm seeing is, is American coaches who've never played the sport of cricket who just don't quite understand it. And it is quite unique in terms of it's not baseball because it's, it's, it's five days long. That's how long a game of cricket can be. <laughs> okay. Right? So like that's and it's hard, and it's and, and this this is incomprehensible for Americans. Yeah. It is, and, it's, and and this is what I speak to you about, and they talk about the endurance because I I love like don't get me wrong, I'm with you on this now. I'm with you that sport athletes like hockey, soccer, all these things, you, you don't need to get them running hours and hours and stuff here, right? You, you just don't. That's I'm I'm with you completely. I'm I'm from a background where I was a mountain guide, and like I've come from a training background where I I had to do a lot of zone two stuff years ago to enable me to keep going. That wasn't power. That was because I needed to physically build me up to that. So I've I've come from a world where there was, I've always been doing zone two, like in a long, you know, in, in a funny kind of way, but I've also done a sport which is power-based. And in cricket, you need everything because if you haven't got a good aerobic system, you ain't going to last eight hours in a day. But then if you haven't got speed and power, you're doing multiple repeat sprints time after time after time again. It's crazy. Too, like I always look at, I think where we miss out is realizing that we're getting the capacity is being developed via the game and we don't yep. give them credit. Exactly. Yeah. The other thing I'm realizing, uh, James, with you is you are rapidly moving into the Forrest Gump category with me in terms <laughs> of I realized that you you were like a policeman and a mountain guide. Yeah. And you, were doing, you were driving and you are doing fitness work and I'm like, maybe you just don't look old enough. I'm not sure, but you've, <laughs> you can pull out into like French. I'm like, where, yeah. like, where did this guy come from? Where did you, where did you find him, Josh? Yeah, <laughs> oh, somewhere in deepest darkest. Somewhere ways. deepest dark as well. It literally is. I, I, I'm, it's yeah. honestly, it's just driving me nuts. But this, this is this is the thing I'm seeing at the moment. It's like, like what I've known about zone two and everything for a long time. Like, and and I've, I've particularly the benefits for health. We've I've known this for a long time. Why is it that so now now is the buzzword of the industry? Zone two is like the buzzword of the industry. And it's like I find it comical that for so many years, you know, those coaches were like cracking all over zone two, saying it like it has its place. It's not not I've never said it was the right thing for like can this you know power sports and I'm not saying that at all, but in terms of a lot of people we work in terms of health, 35 plus, I think it's always had a big part. Why is it that people are now only just starting to talk about it and like well, come out? I think a lot of it has to do with uh, guys like Peter Atia and Huberman yeah. because you've got some really good podcasts now. And mm -hmm. Peter Atia has done a really, really good job of getting right out in front of people and saying, wait, you know, like there are those of us not, like I'm not a doctor. You want to think in the U.S. people have a huge respect for doctors, probably too much to some at some degree. Mm -hmm. But a guy like him coming out and saying, well, no, wait a second, exercise is really, really important, way more yeah. important. And we're a drug culture mm -hmm. in America. I, I don't know about you guys, but we're yeah, absolutely similar. We're going and, that way. <laughs> you know, we always say, you know, the idea like in America, uh, the analogy I always use, it would be like, you know, if you were driving your car and your check engine light came on, 
and you went to the mechanic and he was like, yeah, I got duct tape here. I'll put it over the light so you don't see it. <laughs> and you kind of be like, that that really isn't going to fix whatever's wrong in my engine. But that's what we do in America. You know, you go to them, you say, I have a symptom, I have this symptom. And they say, oh, I have something that takes that symptom away. And you look and think, but but isn't it a symptom like of a disease? Mm-hmm. You know, if you just make the symptom go away, does, does the disease, does my underlying disease condition go away? No. You know, mm-hmm. if I start taking a statin to lower my cholesterol, does my atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease disappear because I took the statin? It's like, no, but your cholesterol number comes down. It's kind of like, but isn't the cholesterol number symptomatic of mm-hmm. something wrong with my heart? We've got, so we're so ass backwards in the U.S. that, and now people are just beginning to realize that and just, there's more people. And as I said, it's, it, you know, again, I'm, I'm a, probably a bigger Atia fan than I think you men can be a little all over the place, but mm-hmm. they're clearly raising people's level of consciousness of the relationship of exercise. The other thing yeah. that brings the pendulum is that all of our information comes from pro sports, um, collegiate sports, those types of things where the zone two stuff isn't important. Yeah. It's not all that relevant. And so as a result, then you have people in the fitness world, you know, we've got people who I just had someone come today and say, you know, I was at a wake for somebody. I mean, he died from being sedentary. And that was the, the, the cause of death was, you know, lack of movement. He just didn't. Mm-hmm. And so I think we're, we're, we're playing, we always play in this sort of pendular environment where yeah. you never get anything to be in the middle. It's got to either be on one end or be on the other end. And yeah. now, you know, again, we had to kind of live through the CrossFit thing and CrossFit mm-hmm. had, to hurt, you know, thousands and thousands of adults yeah. and then realize, okay, okay, well, right, now we can establish that that wasn't probably a good idea, uh, you know, and now, but now people are back, oh, you know, you got to do more aerobic work, more zone two work, more long, mm-hmm. and then, but then you, you were trying to swing people away, but don't run, you yeah. know, because if you run, you're going to get hurt, you know, so it's sort of, you're constantly kind of chasing two rabbits, I guess, and, yeah. and not, not where they say if you chase two, you catch zero. Right, right? Yeah. Exactly, and, that, and that, that was the thing for us, and that was just like, because I think because we weren't, like I, my background is elite military and law enforcement. That was, that was hitting where it's again that those guys are beaten, beaten and broken down. That's that's where it was. That's that's where their issues were, and it was more a case of building them back up. So I never, I never worked in the pro sports field. So I've always, we've always, me and Josh have always specialized in, in this aging athlete. I call it, you know, the everyday athlete, thirty five, forty plus. But we've always put thought building, you know, to to maximize your anaerobic threshold, you need to be strong enough to go deep enough into that and need to you need to have an a basic aerobic capacity. Most pro athletes have that basic aerobic capacity anyway. Most everyday people don't. Right. And, that, exactly. and that's the thing we found. And, that, and that's and that's what we that's what we're trying to get across to people. And they're like, no, no, no. But the thing that's the thing is like that you can't take a pro athlete who spent 20 years doing all of, all these things and building it up. Like that that's well Joe Bloggs or you know whoever it is who's been sitting on the couch for 20, 30 years. They haven't got any aerobic capacity. They can't walk sixty minutes. They can't walk twenty minutes, let alone sixty minutes. If that makes yeah. sense. And we had to build yeah, them up. I, I had one of my clients. I can still remember. He was an MIT professor, brilliant guy. And I mean, I got his heart rate up to one twenty, and it was really funny. We were at that time. We had a step mill, so I just had him walking on the step <laughs> mill, thinking, "Okay, this is pretty good." He got up to one hundred twenty beats a minute on his heart rate monitor, and he was like, ah, "I have to get off." Mm-hmm. And I was like, "Why?" And he literally, I always say, he's the only guy to ever use the word swoon in my gym. He was like, <laughs> swoon. And I was like, Ken, you're the first guy to ever swoon here. I said, I don't think anyone ever swooned here before you. But he was dizzy at 120 beats a yeah. minute. Yeah. yeah. And I was thinking, you know, I was so like at that time, I hadn't, I'd done so little general public stuff that I thought, yep. 120 beats a minute. And this guy's like, he's literally he's feeling faint. Yeah. And, and that, and that my, James said that's why we're such big fans of uh, Zone Two for Gen Pop. You know? Yeah, and that, yeah, and that, and that, and that was that, and it's like, that was the thing for us as well. And it's, it sounds so crazy. I mean, this this is me, it will finish this off here now, Max. I'm, I'm, I appreciate you, you've taken a lot of time to do this today. But then we had to dumb it down even more. So we've gone taking aerobic capacity. It's so so hard to follow down to walking. So we into we introduced a walking test. So, like for, for most of our aging guys, and just basic to build up aerobic capacity. So we we said twenty minutes. Try and walk as far as you can in twenty minutes. The goal is to get one and a half miles because we're trying to build up their walking speed with reserves, right? Try and build them walk walking far, like speed reserve in in, in sprinting, right? 
So we're trying to build up here now. Most of them couldn't do it. Like most of them are hitting a mile. Like they, they just physically couldn't get that here and, you know, like everything here along here. So we've gone, right, can you walk? Well, three miles an hour is a 20 minute mile. So the average yeah. person walking, you know, again, it goes back to your math thing, right? I mean, yeah. three miles an hour is a pretty decent walk. If you put the treadmill on at three miles an hour and start walking, you're like, yeah, this is a decent walk. But if you said to somebody, you know, I want to walk, you know, two oh, miles yeah. at that time, you got to be clipping at four and a half. You almost have to be running. Yeah. Mm, yeah. And that's what we're trying to do. So like we, the, the study we found was that the, they need to, people need to be walking around four miles an hour and it increases their longevity. And there was a study of like 30,000 women in their seventies or something. And that was the, what they found. And we're like, you know what, we can do this. So that's, that's what we did. So we, we started creating, and my God, we got people walking like crazy now. <laughs> like literally is one, of, is one of the tests we put everyone through because we're finding not just everyday people, but some of our pro guys can't walk fast. And, and, and I, can't, take, I, can't walk, I can't walk fast because I'm broken down. But yeah, I can't get my heart rate up enough to make walking even be zone two. Like I can't yeah. get the zone two range from walking, but I can cycle. Like I mean, yeah, I can cycle at the top level for my age. You know, there's very few people that will keep up with me in their sixties. If yeah. we said we're going to go and do, you know, any type of cycling test, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's why you know I've become huge. All we have are uh, assault bikes. That's it. Yeah, it's pretty brilliant. That's I wish I, I wish that bike. I wish yeah, they were more readily available. Arms and legs moving. Yeah, yeah. No, heart we're, rate we're, gets up easily. You know, you easily can elevate your heart rate into any area that you want. Yeah, and it's, there's no technique. Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. no technique. I, I, we love it. We absolutely love it. I'll tell the spin class. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> we'll offend other people today. Josh, go on, you finish, you finish Yeah, off. thank you so much. We will wrap it up there because we've taken up a ton of your time. We'll definitely get you back on because, like I said, we've barely scratched the surface on things. I think we could go yeah. on for hours and hours. But I've got kids to uh, to bath as well. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's right. It's nighttime for you guys. I yeah, forgot. Exactly. Uh, before we do go, day, Mike. I was, I was like, I can't, I can't sit here on the on the computer for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've yeah. got work to do as well. you got people to train. Uh, before we do go, if people want to find out more about you, follow you on uh, Instagram, Twitter and potentially TikTok. Can you give out your digits? Uh, Twitter is mboyle1959. Instagram is michael underscore boyle1959. Those are the, the, the two biggies for us. And uh, and keep your eye out for TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> Amazon UK does yeah, have them for the book. For the book. Yes, absolutely. Get hold of the copy of the book. It books. Is, yeah, it's, uh, it's fantastic. Um, I highly, highly recommend it. Mike, uh, thank you so much. James, thank you as well. Thank you guys for listening. Until next time.